Good evening, everyone. It is Saturday, May the 8th, 2021. It is currently 5.20 p.m. Central Time, and I'm once again coming to you live from Victory Baptist Church. I'm still here in the empty sanctuary, and I remember I told you I had a stack of stuff, right? I had to use, I had to pull up a U-Haul truck to get everything inside of all the things I want to talk about, and we didn't even get close. We, we didn't even, we, we, we didn't even really scratch the surface, and I was going to turn on the microphone to to get to what you know one of the other things I wanted to get to, but I decided to stop and not do that. One, because I always try to find balance, right? If I'm talking about things going on in the church, things happening when I, when I, when I'm talking about everything going on, I always have to balance that out with once again making us stop and turning our attention back to the Word of God and getting our focus there. We have to balance that out. Look, we can run from one controversy to another controversy. We can run from one news article to another news article. But if we remember what establishes a biblical worldview is not us looking at news articles. It's constantly getting our minds into the Word of God. So that's why I keep doing the Bible study exercises, the Greek word of the day. Those different kinds of things are trying to balance out everything we're trying to do, all right? And another reason I I decided to to go a different direction is it is Saturday evening, so I've got to also utilize my time where maybe I can talk to you and give you a Bible study exercise, but I also can do a little sermon prep for myself. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to... I'm going to try to get you prepared for what I'm going to be preaching on tomorrow, and I'm going to try to invite everyone to be a part of this, all right? Now, typically, I don't try to promote my sermons too much, but in this particular case, I'm going to promote what was going to be a series of sermons that is going to be very controversial, probably going to offend a lot of people. I can almost guarantee I'm going to lose some listeners because anytime I've ever dealt with a subject, you lose listeners, which is sad. Look, you don't have to agree with me on everything. I mean, you do have the freedom to be wrong, but that doesn't mean you should stop listening to the person who's right. I mean, I'm joking, I'm joking. But no, people uh, get very sensitive to where we are. See, we are in the book of Romans. And we are about to open the door and step into a room (laughs) that should have a big sign on the the door that should say, warning, keep out. It should say, warning, keep out, but we're going to open the door and walk in anyway. Because it's dangerous territory because we're going to start talking about things that are sometimes connected to a word that you're not supposed to say in some circles. You ready? Now, I I don't even like using the word, but we have to use it because it'll let people know where we're going. Calvinism. Shh, shh, shh. Don't say that word. Bad word. Yeah, and some people, they get very emotional and very upset. We're going to be talking about things that are related to this subject of Calvinism. Uh, that, And a lot of people will immediately not want to hear it. But look, here's what I want you to understand. We're not going to be studying Calvinism. We're going to be studying Romans chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8, and we're, 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 we've been studying Romans chapter 8, but where we're going in Romans chapter 8 is going to deal with issues that people place, oh, that's that Calvinism stuff. How about, no, it's that Romans stuff. How about, no, it's that stuff that's found on the pages of Scripture. And we have to deal with it whether you like it or not. don't like it. You can't, you can't reject a biblical doctrine because you don't like it. You can't decide to just, let's get through that Scripture as fast as we can because we don't like it and it's going to cause controversy. We, I've seen so many pastors, they handle this with like, they're, they're, it's like the their Bible is like 300 degrees. And they're like, ooh, ooh, okay, be careful, be careful. Okay, let me lay that down. Okay, we're going to move on really quick because I don't want to burn my hand. No, you don't want to, you don't want to cause problems in the church, but it shouldn't cause problems in your church because your people should be trained to say, teach us the text, whether we like it or don't like it. You teach the text with or without offense to friend or foe. You just tell us what it says. Now, I'm borrowing from a quote that used to be on the front of the Abilene Reporter News. I don't remember who stated it or who quote, who, where the quote comes from, but it, it always stuck with me my whole life. That's what I need to do. My job is to stand behind the pulpit and deal with the text. No matter what's there, no matter how many problems it leads to. We did that yesterday in the Bible study exercise on John chapter seven. I, I've been bothered by that Bible study exercise 
pretty much all night. I wanted to come back and try to clarify it, but part of me, I don't want to clarify it because I want to leave it to you to struggle with. I mean, what's going on there in John 7? I, I, mean, there, there's some, I have some questions I cannot answer. You know what? Just because we can't answer it doesn't mean we, we ignore it. It means we just face the problem head on. But we're coming into Romans chapter 8, and we're going to end up talking about things like predestination. We're going to be talking about things like election. We're going to be talking about things like calling, right? Things that, 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 that just, for some reason, spark so much controversy. And, I, and trust me, I know, because the first Bible Institute that I was a student in, I got kicked out for simply studying the doctrine of election and predestination. I got kicked out. And then for me to come back, I had to agree to some foolish statement that demonstrated they didn't even understand the doctrine of election or predestination. So I just said, yeah, I can agree with that because what they asked me to agree with in no way, shape, or form contradicted the doctrine of election or predestination because I didn't even understand the doctrine that they were condemning. But okay, I went along, whatever. Still, ultimately, it all blew up in any way. But the bottom line is, is I've had to deal with the consequences of even studying the doctrine. We've had people who are going to come to this church. And when we were on Christian radio and in one Sunday morning, they were on their way here. They were thinking about joining. They were driving on the way here. And then I started, I was talking about the election or predestination or something. And they turned, they stopped the car and turned around and never came back because you were not even supposed to talk about it. You're not even supposed to, you're not even supposed to look at it. You're just supposed to pretend that it's not there, that it just, that whole thing that happened in church history, just just ignore it. Just ignore it because people get mad. When I I got in trouble when I at the uh, at a second church I was at in Nebraska because I was teaching uh, things related to doctrine and predestination to the singles, and I get called going, "Hey, someone's upset. Some parents upset." I'm like, "Parent, these ki- these kids are like." 18, 19, 20. They're not, they're not teenagers. They're adults. The adults cannot sit in a classroom and be taught this doctrinal system that has been made present in church history, just even from just a historical perspective. You know, you know, no, no, you, you, it's just so crazy how the church handles things. But we're going to approach it, but we're going to approach it in a way that you, that maybe you've heard it approached this way, but we're going to do it very different. Because I could come in and just say, here's, here's this system, here's this system. Here's the strength of this system, here's the strength of that system. But we're not going to look at it from the perspective of a system. We're going to look at it from uh, being very exegetical based off what the text says. But I'm going to get us tomorrow to where we're going in a very unique way. All right, so go to Romans chapter eight. I know what you're thinking. There's five words. Yeah, I'm going to give you the five words and I'm going to hand them off to you and I'm not going to tell you anything about them, but here we go. Romans chapter eight, all right? There's a very, there's something very important here that we need to get to. All right, so in Romans chapter eight, if you go to Romans chapter seven, we, we talked a lot about sin and that even, uh, and then Paul even says in Romans seven twenty five that he thanks God through Jesus Christ, uh, that with his mind, he will serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. That even as a believer, he's still going to be struggling with sin. In his flesh, he's still going to be struggling with sin, all right? Then we come into Romans 8. We talk about that there's now no condemnation for, for them who walk in Christ Jesus, all right? For those who are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation because Christ's righteousness. Then we talk about the whole, the Spirit and what the Spirit does in and through us. Okay, we, we talked about all of this. And then we come to this very very, 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 very important section that I think often gets overlooked, all right? Um, Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans 8, verse 18. Now, for those who've been listening to the sermon series, this is going to be a review, but but I'm going to really stress this tomorrow so that everyone's on the same page, all right? Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we have present suffering, future glory. Verse 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. We have present waiting and a future manifestation. And that future glory 
is connected with the future manifestation of the sons of God. When the, when the, when the sons of God are ultimately made manifest, when, they are, when we, we are finally, as Christians, we are glorified and we are made manifest, then the waiting will be over. Then the future glory will be present. All right, verse 21, because the creature itself or creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption or I'm sorry, go back to verse 20. I'm, I'm sorry, I skipped to verse 20. That's the verse I really wanted to get to, verse 20. For the creature, for creation, was made subject, was subjected, all of creation was subjected to vanity, to futility, to meaningless. All of creation was subjected to vanity, meaningless, frustration, emptiness. And notice not willingly. Creation did not willingly choose this being subjected to vanity. That demonstrates someone is in charge, not creation. And who is that person who subjected it? Well, look at it. Verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who have subjected the same in hope. We believe that him there is referring to God because he subjected it in hope. You can't say that that was Adam who subjected creation to futility because he did not subject it in hope. God subjected all of creation to futility, but he did also in hope knowing that there would come a future restoration and a new heaven and a new earth and a new and a deliverance, which the next verse alludes to. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of the children of God. All right, so ultimately there is coming a future glory, a future manifestation, a future deliverance. But in the meantime, there is a present suffering, a present futility that we all understand, we all experience. That's the life we live in. Even though we are believers, we still experience that suffering, that futility, and we even we still experience that struggle with sin. That's the reality. But there is a future hope, and that will show up with the manifestation of the children of God and then all this. But God is the one who subjected it, demonstrating that who is in charge? God, not creation. Creation is not in charge. They did not choose to be subjected to it, but they are subjected to it. They, that's, the, that's the reality. Now, as a result of all of this present situation, there is a groaning that is going on. All of creation is groaning. Creation is groaning. We are groaning. There is a groaning that is occurring. You can read about that, that groaning starting in verse, uh, verse 22. The whole creation groaneth. And you can read about the other groanings that are going on. Verse 22, verse 23, verse 24, verse 25, verse 26. And then we read this, verse 27. Or verse 28, here we go. And we know that all things, what things? All of the suffering, all of the futility, all of the struggle with sin, all of those things work together for good to them that love God. Now, how can all of that bad work together for good? Now, that good is not good for like, hey, it's gonna make all of that suffering go away because that suffering is not going to go away until the ultimate glorification. So God works all things together for good, not the good of the immediate situation, but the eternal good, his eternal glory, God being glorified. All of this is working together for the good of God's glory. Now, we've talked about this. We, we, will, we will probably mention a little bit more tomorrow. Now, this is very important. If creation did not subject itself to vanity, but God did, that demonstrates God is in charge. If all things work together for good, right? All things work together uh, for good to them that love God, to them who are, who are the called according to his purpose. Please note, it works together for, for good to those who love God, to, for believers. God uses all of this suffering, all of this groaning, all of this sin. He works it all for good, for his glory. That's the ultimate good. That demonstrates that he has to be in charge. He has to be sovereign. If he's not sovereign and in charge of everything, then it could not all work together for good. It would be random. It would be, well, maybe it will, maybe it will not. God works it together for good because God is in charge. He subjected it. 
He works all, to, all, all of it for good, which demonstrates he is sovereign. He is sovereign. Now, once we establish that God is sovereign over creation, he is sovereign even over everything that happens to work it for good, that begins to establish a truth. If God is sovereign in all of that, then is he sovereign in any way, shape, or form when it comes to your salvation and my salvation? It would seem to indicate that is true. So look what happens. God works all things together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, here we go. Here are the five words. For whom he did foreknow. Foreknow, or you could put down the word foreknowledge. This is word number one, foreknowledge. All right, foreknowledge. Foreknowledge, let me go here. I'm going to open up my notes really quick. Foreknowledge. I want you to write down the word foreknowledge or foreknow. And I want you to do some just basic work on what does that word foreknowledge mean? What does foreknowledge mean in an English dictionary? What does foreknowledge mean looking up the Greek word? What does that Greek word mean? How is that Greek word is used? Just you need to know what the Bible says about foreknowledge. Now, you may, you're, what you're going to try to do is go, okay, no, 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 no. See, see, foreknowledge only means, and you're going to start trying to explain it away. Do not do that. What does the word mean? Foreknowledge, right? Second word, for whom he did foreknow, for no, he also did predestinate. He also did predestinate. So write down foreknowledge, write down predestination. Foreknowledge and predestination. Now, if you come up with some system that gets around foreknowledge and predestination by saying that really God's not doing anything. He's just looking to see what I do. And in what I do, then he does something based off what I do. Then that's not God doing any foreknowledge or any predestinating. That's me doing everything. So either God's doing it or not doing it. Who subjected creation to vanity? Creation didn't do it. It wasn't its will. It was God. Who works everything out according to good? God, not us. God. So if God is in charge of all of that, then all of a sudden when it starts getting ready to talk to our salvation, it says this God who subjected creation to vanity, who works all things together for good, he, for, he has foreknowledge and he, predestined, he predestines. So put foreknowledge, predestinate, all right, uh, to be conformed to the image of, the, of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Number three, uh, here's the third word. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called, called or calling, called or calling. That's the third word. You know, the fourth word, those he called, he justified. Those he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. So what are the five words? Foreknowledge, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. Those are the five words. Foreknowledge, predestination, uh, calling, justification, glorification. Write those five words down and look up everyone. Let's make sure we have all of them. So we have foreknowledge, we have predestination, we have calling, we have justification, and we have glorification. And I want you to realize this: how this works. The person that God predestines will be glorified. The, God, the person God foreknew will be glorified because God's doing it. He's doing the foreknowing. He's doing the predestined. He's doing the calling. He's doing the justifying. He's doing the glorifying. He's doing it all. Just like he works all things together for good, just like he subjected all creation to vanity. He's in charge. If you come up with some solution that removes God from being in charge and God is either just reacting or God is not really doing anything, you're destroying the whole chapter. You're destroying the whole chapter, but we have to figure out what these five words mean. So there is your Bible study. I want you to look, and I really, I want you to just start doing work on it. Look up each word, look up what they may mean in the English, look up the Greek word behind each one, look them up. Now, and I t forget everything you've ever been taught. Just look them up and don't be scared. Don't be frightened. 
Don't be worried. Now, look, when when we work through this, there's times I'm probably going to say things that's going to tick off the people who are, quote unquote, the Calvinist. And there's times I'm probably going to tick off people who are, quote unquote, the non-Calvinist, the Arminians, or whatever the case may be, semi-Pelagian, whatever category you want to put them in. Here's the thing. My job is to figure out what the text says. And wherever the text leads us, that's where we're going, with or without offense to anybody. I don't care. And neither should you. You should say, we, I, need to, I need to hear what the text says. Don't be afraid of it. If you're going to come with your presupposition to make it say what it will make you feel better, then you shouldn't probably engage in Bible study. Five words. You need to have, make sure you understand what they know. You've got to make sure you understand that. God foreknows. Okay, well, how, how complete is God's knowledge? I mean, there's a lot of different directions we could go. We won't go there right now. All right? Those are the five words. Foreknowledge predestination, calling, justification, glorification. You need a right understanding of all five words. An incorrect understanding of any of those words will lead you to an incorrect understanding of the basics of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. I think you'll end up getting the gospel wrong. All right, there you have it. I I, I know you're saying, well, you do more. No, this Bible study exercise, remember, I only do part of it. And tomorrow morning at about 11.15, 11.20, 11.30, I don't know what time we'll start, uh, we'll start working on this section of Romans. It's going to be fun. It's going to be challenging. I hope that you will benefit from it. All right, I'm going to stop right there. There's so much more I want to do tonight, but I can't. I will say this, one last thing, theologycentral.net. Please be checking out the blog section. I'm adding new, con- I'm adding content every day. If I listen to any kind of podcast I think is interesting, I'm embedding it right there. So, and you can listen to whatever I post right there. You don't have to follow a link. You have to go anywhere else. Theologycentral.net. Please check the blog section on like every day, like multiple times a day, because we're, we're, we're paying money for that. So I'm trying to utilize it more and more and more. All right. And uh, the Bible memory app, um, I'm going to be putting, I think, First Timothy. I don't know. I'm going to find some scriptures to put there. So uh, I'll be updating that as well. And then don't forget the TheologyCentral.net book club. I added a book just a little while ago. I was sitting here and I added a book a little while ago because I heard a discussion about it on Christian radio. So, uh, in fact, we were going to discuss that book here in a little bit, but we've run out of time. Um, so go to the, uh, the if you go to theologycentral.net while you're there, look for the drop down menu. You'll see theologycentral.net. You'll see Theology Central Book Club. Click on it. It'll take you to, it'll give you a link to go to the book club. And you can join the book club. It's absolutely free. You don't have to buy anything. But whenever I come across a book that I think is interesting, that doesn't mean I always agree, I will put it right there. And then you can look at it and say, oh, okay, that's what he's reading. Or, oh, oh, man, that book's garbage. And, and you may be, I may think the same thing and you can email me and tell me what you think and we can have a discussion about it. All right, there you go. Five words, five words. Start working on them. All right, if you have any questions or you're confused, email me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. But note how that chapter, he subjected it. He works all things out together for good. That If that doesn't scream that God is sovereign, I don't know what will. So we need a a good understanding of God's sovereignty before we can proceed, which I think right now I may be changing up my sermon for tomorrow. Maybe changing up my sermon for tomorrow now that I'm thinking about it. I think I'm going to. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great evening. God bless.